By now, you've probably heard of the popular TV show that portrays the cordyceps fungus infecting humans and turning them into zombie-like creatures. But let me tell you, the real-life scenario is much more terrifying. I work in a lab that specializes in plant and fungus experimentation. Our primary focus is on developing new drugs for the pharmaceutical industry, including everything from anti-aging remedies to creating the next blue pill. However, we also receive significant funding from the Defense Department, and their research requirements are much more sinister. How are the new test subjects doing? Stephen, our lab supervisor, asked as he approached me carrying a clipboard. He gestured towards the eight test rooms in front of us. Number four looks promising, and I think six and seven are starting to show signs, I said, looking up from my workstation. Inside the eight test rooms were five men and two women, one in each room, plus a single empty room. It was left empty after a rogue monkey from the earlier phase experiments had managed to escape its cage and break the pass-through window, which is used to transfer materials and instruments between sterile and non-sterile rooms. Steven nodded, a look of excitement on his face. Excellent. We're getting closer, and the cages test subject 1, 2, 3, and 5 appeared to be behaving somewhat normally, pacing their small 8x8 cage or talking to themselves. However, test subject 4 had remained motionless now for about 2 hours, lying on his side with his back to us as his chest rises and falls as his only movement. Meanwhile, test subjects 6 and 7 had recently become lethargic, barely responding to the electric shocks administered to their enclosure. All of the test subjects had been exposed to a variety of chemically altered cordyceps fungus. Typically, it cannot infect humans due to our higher internal temperatures, among other factors. However, by modifying the fungus's genetic makeup, we were close to changing that. Let's keep a close eye on those three. Report back to me if there are any updates. Will do, I replied. With that, Stephen left the room, and I returned to monitoring the test subjects' vitals on the screens. Interestingly, subjects 4, 6, and 7 had significantly elevated heart rates, almost 50% higher than the others. Additionally, their endorphin levels, the body's natural painkillers, were unusually high, indicating that they were experiencing intense pain, despite showing none of the typical outward signs. What do you make of this? I asked my lab partner, Mike, while pointing to the screen with my pen. He looked over the vitals on my screen. It looks like they are in intense pain. Those sorts of levels would be what I would expect to see if someone were on fire, he said dryly. Yes, that's what it looks like to me as well, I replied. Our test subjects were some of the worst criminals our government had locked up. The advantage of working for the Defense Department, especially where we required human subjects, was there was no shortage of forgotten criminals, terrorists, murderers, and other violent offenders. These individuals were typically housed in maximum security prisons and were serving lengthy sentences, often for life. While the use of human subjects in scientific experiments is controversial and subject to strict ethical guidelines, the Defense Department saw the need to conduct these tests outside the normal guidelines. Therefore, the rules no longer applied, and we had the green light to do whatever we needed to do to get the result. Let's do a blood test and see if the troponin levels have increased on subject 4, 6, and 7, I said to Mike. Mike nodded and left his seat to get dressed in his hazmat suit. With the heart rate and endorphin levels so extremely elevated, I thought it could be possible that the cordyceps is already spreading through the test subjects, paralyzing them while simultaneously causing immense pain. If my theory was right, then not only will we have successfully managed to infect the first even human with cordyceps, but it would have taken effect within three hours of exposure. Cordyceps is a type of parasitic fungus that primarily infects ants, as well as other insects such as beetles and caterpillars. The infection process begins when a spore of the cordyceps fungus lands on the exoskeleton of an ant. Once the spore is attached to the ant, it begins to grow long, branching filaments that penetrate the ant's exoskeleton and start to invade its body. As the fungus grows, it releases chemicals that alter the ant's behavior, causing it to become disoriented and leave its colony. The fungus continues to grow inside the ant's body, eventually replacing its organs and tissues with a mass of fungal cells. We are not stupid. We know exactly why the defense department would want to, essentially, weaponize this. We do this because we are scientists 
and pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and further understanding the world around us is fundamental to our role. Now fully suited up, Mike entered the first test subject's room, number 4, and activated the cage squeeze function. The cage started to close in on the test subject, squeezing him from front and back. This process meant Mike could get up and close to the test subject without risk to himself. But just as the cage closed in tight, locking the subject in place, his skin burst from multiple areas, and sharp, dagger-like spores fired out in all directions. Freaking out, Mike turned and ran for the door he just came through. I reached for the emergency lockdown button to prevent him from leaving and hit it a second too late. Mike ran out into the connecting corridor, screaming in pain. Some of the spores had penetrated his suit and were now drilling their way into his body as Mike screamed and clawed at the holes, ripping his hazmat suit while trying to grab them out. I activated the alarms and locked down my door as Mike thrashed about in the corridor. A few minutes later I heard security come running down the hall and yell at Mike to get down, but he was in too much pain to respond. The security guards continued to yell at Mike, tasers drawn, when Mike suddenly started running at them. Without flinching, both security guards tasered Mike, dropping him onto the floor. They then slowly approached him to restrain him, when suddenly Mike's body tore open and fired out more dagger-like spores. Impossible. I yelled at the camera as I watched both guards get hit by the spores. The cordyceps had multiplied and spread within minutes. The guards, now themselves in agonizing pain, ran back through the doors that they came from and into one of the main lab halls where more than a dozen researchers were working. Watching through the cameras, I saw the researchers panicking and trying to escape through the now locked doors as the two security guards thrashed around. Then, just like Mike, the security guard's skin split open, firing multiple spores around the room. Most of the researchers had now been infected, and those that avoided being struck by the spores weren't so lucky. A few minutes later, as more spores went flying around the room, soon, every researcher was infected, screaming and writhing in agony. I stayed in my locked room for hours, watching as the infected slowly stopped moving. One by one, they collapsed to the floor around tabletops, and I watched in horrified amazement as fungal growth started to sprout from the holes in their skin. I eventually put on a hazard suit, unlocked the door, and left the office, slowly walking toward Mike's still body. By now he was covered in fungal stalks and mushroom-like growths, and one had even grown right through his eye socket, popping his eyeball out to the side. But, that wasn't the worst thing. The worst thing was his other eye, which was fixated on me which had an expression of sheer terror and agony. He was alive, paralyzed, and appeared to be feeling every horrifying moment as the cordyceps slowly dissolved his internal organs and replaced them with fungal growths. I'm sorry Mike, I whispered, genuinely upset at his predicament. Mike was a good guy, but I knew I couldn't help him. The cordyceps was devouring his internal organs as he lay there, so I did what any good scientist would do. I carefully took a sample of the growth from his eye socket and a blood sample. I then carefully attached a mobile heart rate monitor to his arm through one of the ripped holes Mike had made earlier and then slowly backed away back into the secure room, locked the doors, and awaited my rescue. The information I could get from Mike would no doubt prove invaluable for our next attempt. So here I wait. It has taken longer than I thought to be rescued. It has now been about 60 hours since Mike got infected. The bodies are now unrecognizable lumps of fungal growths, and Mike's heart finally stopped registering a pulse around 15 hours ago, which means he was alive for two whole days after the infection. He did have multiple heart attacks during that time, no doubt from the pain of different organs turning to slush, but somehow he was kept alive. I have tried the internal lines multiple times, but no one is answering. It's probably a security protocol I am unaware of, and I can't see the cameras outside this part of the facility, but I am sure they are just taking extreme precautions. After all, the last thing anyone would want is for this to escape the lab. But I'm sure everything is fine. At least, I hope it is. It has now been 270 hours, or just over 11 days, since the first spores infected Mike. I have slowly accepted that help may not be coming, as some had suggested in the comments in my last post. So for the past few days, I have been planning my escape. I am not sure what happened outside of my lab area or the conversations my superiors have been having, but I am assuming it has been deemed too risky to attempt a rescue at this stage. There are still no internal comms working, the phones are still down and the internet chat is disabled. Actually, that's not quite accurate. 
the phones don't seem to be technically down, it is more like no one is answering them. The only item that is working is this tablet, set up to share documents, and files on our internet only, which I managed to jailbreak and connect to an external cell tower somewhere. Unfortunately, this section of the lab is located underground, and there is no reception. Every now and then, however, it does connect with a single bar. It is a brief connection, usually only seconds, and while I did once manage to connect a call, it dropped out almost immediately, but it was enough to upload my last report online, and hopefully it will be enough to do it again. There have been a few developments in my current situation that I need to share. These developments have impacted some of my plans and have also put me under some pressure to fast track my escape. Firstly, our test subjects. As mentioned earlier, test subject 4 was the one that showed the earliest signs they were experiencing a positive reaction to the cordyceps, which was later confirmed. I know some of you will find my use of the term positive as an oxymoron, but from my point of view that's what it was. Well, it seems that the cordyceps compound had also worked on test subject 6 and 7, though it took another 72 hours for that to be confirmed. They had both been lying, almost completely still in their cages, the monitors displaying their vitals indicating they were still very much alive, like 4, in extreme pain. That's when 6 started to violently convulse, thrashing about his cell like a puppet being pulled by all the strings at the same time. Not long after, his head suddenly jerked back at a seemingly impossible angle, splitting him open at the neck as a long, wet fungal stalk pushed its way out of his throat. He collapsed to the ground, and his vitals immediately flatlined, as the fungal stalk unfurled and stretched across a small cage. Seven was more interesting. Shortly after Six's head popped off, Seven started to convulse, but Seven somehow managed to regain some motor control, scratching at his eyes, and managed to scream out help me, before both his eyes were violently forced out of their sockets as grey-green fungal stalks pushed their way through the path of least resistance. He continued to thrash and scream as his shirt rippled and moved, with dozens more stalks slowly ripping through the soft skin around his rib cage. Ten hours later, his screams had stopped, most likely due to the large stalk that had worked its way out of his mouth. The other subjects, 1, 2, 3, and 5, showed no signs of delayed infection. They died from having no access to food or water for 11 days, which, in hindsight, seems like a preferable way to have gone. They, of course, had no idea what had happened to the others, and had spent the first few days screaming and yelling for help while trying to break out of their cages. I eventually muted their feed but kept the visuals going in case a delayed infection presented itself. None did though, which was a little disappointing. Also, on day 6, the power cut out. The backup generators kicked in along with the emergency lighting, casting the hallways and labs in a slow, flashing, blood-red hue. Mike's disfigured body in the hallway, and those of the guards and lab technicians in the main lab hall, become an even more terrifying sight in the low red light. The flashing lights almost gave the bodies a new life, casting dancing shadows around them. Also, the blood that had pooled around each body from the wounds, where the spores had torn their skin, had seemingly become the perfect ground for fungal growth. Large patches of mucus-colored growths spread out from the bodies, like lumpy tentacles feeling their way across the floor and up the walls. And then, three days ago, Mike's head broke off and slid away. Yes, you read that right and I didn't even notice it happen. Mike was essentially just a large, semi-human shaped lump of colorful fungal growths by then, but I had been observing him on the monitors long enough to notice that something drastic had changed. I had to rewind the security footage to see what had happened, and sure enough, at around 11.30 the night before, his head fell from his body and onto the floor. Then, like a fast moving snail, it slid off down the hall towards my door, where it stopped for a few minutes and seemed to feel around the edges like it was looking for a way in. Then, it turned suddenly and took off, continuing down the hall and around the corner where it moved out of sight. It was fascinating and terrifying at the same time. The fungal stalk from his eye socket almost looked like a snail's eye, moving around as the head slid like it was directing it as it went. But the thing that had me worried was the question, why did it stop at my door like that? Could it tell I was in here? Would it try again? I started to plan my escape at that point. This lab, as I have previously mentioned, primarily focuses on drug development for the pharmaceutical industry. The main building is a two-storied glass and brick building located in the mountains, 30 minutes from the city outskirts. The area I work in is located 30 meters directly below the main building. There are two main ways out. 
the elevator which goes straight up to the main building and an emergency exit. The emergency exit leads to a two mile long corridor which eventually exits a large metal door in the side of the mountain. To get to those exits, I need to get through the doors that the lab technicians were banging on before they were infected. Behind that door is a small hallway with a security desk that then leads to the lobby, a large, pentagon shaped room where the lift and emergency exit are both located. Three of the five walls of the lobby are colored red, yellow, and blue and they all lead through laboratories and testing rooms just like the one I am in. The other two walls in the lobby are white with the reception and admin area on one and offices for the senior managers and supervisors on the other. The emergency exit is located between these two areas. I am currently in one of the research rooms at the back of the yellow lab. The biggest hurdle in my escape plan so far is a large fungal mass against the door in the main lab hall. Two or three bodies have become merged in a large clump of fungal matter and it appears the bodies have what appears to be some sort of slimy mucus become attached to the doors. The doors themselves will be unlocked now that the generators have kicked in so at least it's not all bad news. The entire facility may still be in a code red lockdown meaning I'm unlikely to receive a hero's welcome in the lobby as no one will be there. The red and blue labs would have been evacuated once I activated the alarm so I am unlikely to see anyone until I return to the main lab above ground. I am going to put on my hazmat suit and leave the safety of my office now. The suit is equipped with a camera and voice recorder so I will be recording everything on that from now on in case something goes wrong. I have downloaded all the data from our experiments onto a flash drive which I will be taking with me. I also plan on trying to collect some samples on the way if it is safe to do so so I will have a small bag with plenty of sample tubes, swabs and tongs. I just heard some banging in the ducts and what sounded like something crawling quickly in there so it is time for me to get out of here. Wish me luck. Thank you to my superfans, Sweet Black Swan, Tacey, and Brooklyn. I really appreciate you guys supporting my channel, and I look forward to making more content for everyone.